Welcome to the EverybodyHatesCleveland.com podcast. I'm your host, Jim Pete, joined by my tag team partner and future Attorney General of Alaska. I don't know where that came from, Mike, but you know, I got high hopes for you. Associating me with the state of Palin is not exactly a compliment. So you I know I got to go there. We can pull that. Let's avoid that with the plague. Uh, we continue our positional preview uh, for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, now talking about a, a position a little less sturdy in vision, although perhaps as sturdy as the catcher position and player personnel. Uh, of course, I'm talking about first base. Probably the biggest splash made by the Indians this offseason season was the signing of free agent, first baseman, outfielder, former catcher who won't be catching this year, uh, Mike Napoli. Uh, Napoli struggled last year with Boston for, for much of the year, uh, righted the ship, got healthy, and ended up having a pretty decent year uh, the last couple of months. Uh, it looks like, Mike, he's going to be our starting first baseman this year, at least um, visibly on paper right now. Uh, without games being played. Um, just before we get into the intricacies of how this could really work out, uh, offensively, defensively, what are your thoughts on Napoli as our everyday first baseman? It's better than Carlos Santana as everyday first baseman, in that Santana's still hitting, but he doesn't have a glove on his hand as frequently anymore, which is a positive step in the right direction. Napoli is good defensively. Uh, the other thing is that last year, Brandon Moss played about 50 games at first base and posted a weighted RC plus of under 90. Um, and Napoli last year in his worst year in about six years posted one around 100. Um, and he's a better defender than Moss. So I think it's pretty easy to say that first base got better uh, than it was last year. Um, and I know maybe it doesn't work out like Moss did. I, I think it's it's probably a reasonable assumption, uh, barring unforeseen death and weird circumstances, that it got better. Well, okay. So staying away from death, um, Napoli is 34. And while <sighs> last year's regression, can you can definitively point to certain reasons for that. He's 34, and now he's our starting first baseman. Isn't it reasonable to believe, Mike, that we are in for regression with regards to Mike Napoli? Yeah, the aging curve is is a cruel mistress, as we learn in all of our lives, but particularly Next in baseball. Pleasure. Sorry. Post-30 post life is not cranking, as the young, hey, the young folks would say. Hey, hey. <laughs> You're such a... Now I'm going to cry. Now, now I'm going to cry. Uh, but yes, this there is there's certainly a risk of regression for Napoli, um, and and that's why he's getting one year and seven million dollars with his career track record. Uh, people past people past thirty are risky. People past thirty three are very risky. Um, so Napoli certainly has risk. Uh, I think the positive thing is that. Santana can play first occasionally, and you can protect Napoli. He doesn't need to play 150 games. He needs to play 120. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to play Gomes at first. It gives you an opportunity to mess around with uh, multiple other people playing first. Maybe you uh, maybe you rest Brantley at first every once in a while or at DH. Um, so there's a lot to play with. There's a Big lot of lawn at first, man. Big lawn. Put number eight there. He's the answer. The Sorry. bat plays up well there. Certainly Sorry. does for Lonnie. I, I don't but mean no. that. I, I apologize for anybody listening to this who is offended by my Lonnie Chisholm hate. I apologize. Not really. <laughs> I, I we'll get to him in, in, in right field. But okay, so I think I think and I agree with you, Mike. I think I think Napoli on paper right now is an upgrade defensively. I think offensively we could see. Um, a big boost in our lineup if he just pla is, is, is at a plateau level with uh, what he can do as, when he's healthy. Here's my question. How do they fit together? Because I, I can't fathom that, that Carlos Santana, the guy who tried to play third base 
from what I can gather by every source that I have, who was the one who went to the front office and said, I'll play third base because I don't want to DH. How does Carlos Santana's psyche fit into this? And I mean, I know this is something you can't measure, but Santana is a massive piece to this offense. He, 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 I'm not saying he's a malcontent because I don't think he quite gets there, but I do think that he, you know, he's a happy player. <laughs> he wants to be a happy guy. He wants to be in the field. Is it possible that with the back injury that we heard about late in the year last year, at the end of last year, is it possible that we didn't really see the real Santana at first base last year? He looked pretty good there in, in previous years. His offense seemed to produce more when he played first base. Could last year have been an aberration for Santana? Could signing Napoli be a way to wake Santana up in a lot of different ways. I mean, I mean, see, Francona came out and kind of kind of slammed him offhandedly last year. And we, we talked about this in a podcast with Adam Burke at uh, the tail of last year. He kind of swiped Santana's work ethic last year. Um, was Napoli being penciled in as the first baseman a way maybe to wake Santana up a little bit in, in Francona's eyes? Maybe not in our eyes, but in Francona's eyes. Definitely could be. Definitely could be. And I, I think you hear rumblings about Santana at times being lackadaisical um, and, and Francona riding him for that. And sometimes it's maybe merited and sometimes it seems kind of odd um, considering that he's a guy who kind of battled to remain on the field when Gomes uh, emerged. But I, I, I think, think I think more needs to be said about that, too. I mean, let's you know, this wasn't this wasn't like Francona throwing darts at a board and going, hey, Let's put Santana at third. This was Santana going to the front office and saying, I'm going to play third base. I'm going to do everything I can to play third. And he did. He did everything they asked him to do and more. He looked great that pre- as much as we can, as much as we can handle or hammer, um, as much as we can hammer Santana and Francona for what they did. This is a guy who kind of worked through it and he stunk and we get that. Uh, but but at the end of the day, we need to commend Frank or Santana for that. But I, I again, I throw it back to you, Mike. Um, is Santana going to be content as a DH? How much time do you see him getting at first base? Yeah, you know, I want to hop back onto this this other point for one more second. I think for a guy who had been at that point a proven big league bat. Um, you know, Santana is incredibly productive at catcher before he moves for him to go and spend an entire off season getting heavy innings reps, um, in, in, in winter ball so that he can move to third base and help the team, um, to me signals something pretty important. Um, uh, whether he can, he'll be a malcontent at DH, I don't know. I think one of the things that we're going to be dealing with is I think they're going to be balancing time with Napoli and Santana. I don't think Napoli is going to be dominating first base time because I think they're going to be trying to protect him. I think his bat matters to this lineup enough that they're really going to want to protect his body. So I think Napoli might only play 60 or 70 games at first, and I think Santana might play 80. Um, so I, I think they're going to be protecting Napoli enough and challenge, and it might challenge Santana in a way to put in more effort at first base. So, you know, I think they get a lot of bonus from this. I think they get to protect Napoli with a guy who's still pretty young in Santana, um, and it challenges Santana. So I, I think in that way it's a, a very good fit. So, I mean, is this is this a – do you see a platoon situation? I mean, it seems like both uh, seem to hit uh, – if you look at their s- splits, both seem to hit left-handed pitchers. Uh, a better, but but of course Napoli. I mean, has more power from the right side. I mean, could you see Napoli playing four or five times uh, a week with with Santana getting a couple of times a week, or or do you see this just being Napoli's job to lose? I think they're. I think Santana's going to be. I don't think they're really going to be platoon paired too much. Napoli might be platoon covered a little bit. I think that's a definite possibility where Santana plays first and then you'll do the platoon cover, whether you want to move Brantley uh, to the DH slot that day or Napoli and Santana would normally commingle and put somebody in left to protect Brantley's body and and give Napoli a day off. So I definitely think there'll be more platoon platoon action with Napoli than there will be with Santana. Uh, But you know, I think they're both someone who even against their, their not-so-good split get on base a bunch 
um, which has a lot of value for this lineup. They both have, you know, exceptional walk rates. Um, so I, I think that they'll both be getting a pretty good amount of ABs um, when they're healthy, when they're not protecting their bodies. Here's my question. We'll kind of wrap it up with this. I mean, obviously the position is pretty solid with both guys there. As long as they're healthy, who bats fourth? Napoli has to bat fourth. Santana should be batting first. And I know Frank Conan mentioned this, that, that he had thought about it in the past, which was pretty cruel to anyone who's ever wanted that because uh, it's, it's something we've dreamed of. I want to point out one last thing with, with Santana that kind of is essential to his value. He's had five straight seasons of roughly two and a half wins or more and 150 games played. And one of the really valuable things about Santana, and he is considerably flawed. He's extremely flawed. Um, but one of the valuable things is that he plays consistently. He's never had significant injury issues. The body's never really worn down. And even when he has been hurt, he's played through it, um, which we saw a little bit last year. And he gets on base consistently. And so he's not the anchor in the fourth hole that we want, but he's an anchor in that he's always in the lineup and his production stable. And that adds a lot of value at the first base DH position. Well, we'll get, I, I really want to jump into this lineup thing, but not yet. I think what we'll do with, with regards to lineup uh, overall is let's get through these positions. Um, I still think there might be some people at play and, and, and we will probably have a podcast um, have already gone up regarding um, uh, possible moves. I think we're going to be uh, throwing a pot up, uh, well, when this comes out, probably a couple days ago, uh, talking about some ads that could happen. But uh, once we get to the end of this, uh, Mike and I and, and a few others, maybe we'll roundtable this talking about the Indians lineup offensively uh, and how it could look and maybe how it should look. Uh, I will fall out of a window five stories up. If Carlos Santana bats leadoff, I don't buy it. I don't. I don't care what Frank Ona said. I don't buy it. I, there's no way he does it. I'll, I, no way. But no, he won't. That's he won't. for that's for another day. Um, overall, Mike, thumbs up, thumbs down. You feeling good about first base? Good enough. All right. Uh, on to the next. Uh, the next time you hear us talking about positional battles, we'll be talking about the great J Ram. Oh yeah, and the starter, Jason Kipnis. Him too. Kipnis, if you hear this, sorry, man. I'm older than you. I can probably take you, too. Not really. 